Okay, we're continuing with the history of radio, uh, PowerPoint 5 on slide 13. These are just a few photos showing the best uses of the radio. Um, upper left, you see a man, he's uh, a police officer. You see the police officer in the back. This was the, the fellow who would uh, take the calls at the police station and then alert the particular cars Car 54, where are you? Uh, that was an old TV show about, it was funny, about police officers, and they were trying, always trying to find Car 54. Uh, at any rate, he would be the dispatcher. He would get the calls and then dispatch the orders to the uh, various police officers. Um, lower left, uh, <clears throat> they actually put a radio uh, in a police car. So you have the fellow uh, dispatcher calling the particular police car, and that's where the police officer was getting his instructions from. And then uh, over to the right here, uh, new powerful police radio penetrates dead spots. You know all about dead spots. If you're driving down the highway talking on your cell phone and all of a sudden you have a dropped call, that's because the frequency is dead there. Or you go over a hill and you lose connection, that sort of thing. Uh, moving along with additional uses, look at this woman. I want you to learn about ads. We're going to get into advertising, but look at this woman. She's wearing a mink coat. Okay, there weren't any fake mink coats in those days, and it looks like it's the 40s there, late 40s. Um, this is a wealthy couple. He's wearing a very nice hat uh, and a suit with a white scarf. They're wealthy. Uh, they're wealthy, and therefore they can afford to have a car with a Motorola radio in it. Uh, so this was the first time you saw a radio in a car other than in a police car. Uh, and then you see <clears throat> on the right, radios became quite common in cars. And uh, whereas it used to be that you would buy a car and you would have to order a radio as an accessory, as an expensive accessory. Today, you order a car, you assume there's a radio in it. Absolutely. So um, moving on to 15 um, more development. Regular AM radio broadcasts began in 1920 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the results of the Harding Co Cox presidential election were reported for the first time on radio uh, in that year. Uh, in 1934, Professor Edwin Armstrong, the man we talked about before, and John Bowes, does the name Bose ring a bell to you? Invented FM radio and later stereo FM. So it was not enough to have FM, but you wanted stereo. You wanted two sounds, your bass uh, coming out of here and your uh, higher pitches coming out of the other. Um, and so um, they did that. Uh, let's see what else. <clears throat> Excuse me. John Bose, of course, created the Bose Company, and Bose radios are known to be the best in the business. Um, a horrible long legal fight between friends David Sarnoff and Edwin Armstrong, leaving Armstrong penniless. I told you, uh, Sarnoff became vicious. Uh, he wanted to um, destroy his competitors. He committed suicide. This fight was responsible for AM, even though inferior to FM being the dominant form of radio. So uh, basically, when Sarnoff uh, harassed Armstrong so much that he became depressed and couldn't uh, move forward with his FM, he committed suicide and that was the end of FM in those early years. Uh, just to explain to you what AM and FM are, uh, AM stands for amplitude modulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. What is a radio carrier signal modified by variations in wave amplitude? The wave is not going like this. The wave is, you know, highs and lows and highs. 
FM is frequency modulation. It's a radio carrier signal modified by variations in wave length and frequency. So remember those, okay? Uh, we get into slide 17. Most radio stations in the U.S. that are located west of the Mississippi, I say most, west of the Mississippi River, begin with the letter K in their call letters. There used to be a TV show called um, KMOX. Oh, no. Oh, it was um, something in Cincinnati, whatever. They had a K. So they were located west of the Mississippi. Most stations east of the Mississippi River begin with a letter W in their call letters. This will be very important to you. Remember this. Most of each station's call letters actually stand for something. Uh, you may not have known this, but for example, WIOD in Miami, Florida stands for Wonderful Island of Dreams. WFIE in Evansville, Indiana stands for First in Evansville. WSM in Nashville, Tennessee stands for We Shield Millions because it was owned by an insurance company. KPHX in Phoenix, Arizona stands for PHX, stands for Phoenix. Uh, ABC stands for American Broadcasting Company. CBS stands for Columbia Broadcasting System. NBC stands for National Broadcasting System. PBS stands for Public Broadcasting Systems. Those four systems, um, I want you to remember what they stand for. Going on to slide 18 in this series. Uh, transistor was invented in 1947 by uh, three men, William Shockley, Walter Hauser Brattain, and John Bardeen. They won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1956. I do want to tell you a little bit about John Bardeen. He uh, was a friend of my aunt's because they went to high school together. He graduated from my high school. My high school graduates approximately 40 students a year. It's a small um, accelerated high school program that is owned by the University of Illinois and it's located in Urbana, Illinois and John Bardeen went to that high school. Uh, you will uh, hear in just a second here another accomplishment of Mr. Bardeen that's quite astounding. John Bardeen graduated from my high school, University High School. He won a second Nobel Prize in Physics in 1972 for a fundamental theory. This was uh, 16 years later for a fundamental theory of conventional superconductivity known as the BCS theory. Um, as rare as it is to win one Nobel Prize, just imagine what the odds against winning two Nobel Prizes are. Quite an accomplishment. Slide 19, <clears throat> we go into some further development. In 1954, the transistor radio became available on the market and changed everything. And I'm telling you that um, I was in high school uh, much later than it was um, actually developed. But in high school, everybody had a transistor radio, just like everybody today has an, has an iPhone or something like an iPhone. Everybody then had a transistor. It was smaller than the iPhone. Uh, it was thicker than the iPhone. We're going to see some pictures here in a minute. Um, you no longer had to be driving in your car or sitting at your uh, phonograph in your room at home to be hearing music. You could take this with you. Of course, the transistor itself made so many things possible in electronics, in the things, everything you use today basically has, has a transistor or several types of transistors in them. Um, it makes sending sound uh, portable. And that's what I said, you know, when people first uh, buy things, they're large. 
the first radios were the size of a piece of furniture. People sat around them. You sat around, they were three times as large as, you know, what we look at as a television today or a smaller, you know, medium-sized television. They were huge and they were wide, they were deep, and they were tall. Like I said, a large piece of furniture, like a sofa on its side. It is just amazing. Uh, but then the transistor allowed us to put that into a much smaller package, which was mu much more convenient for people. Uh, the transistor revolution, revolutionized the electronics industry, allowing the information age to occur and made possible the development of almost every modern electronic device from telephones to computers to missiles, ammunition, missiles in war. Bardeen's developments in superconductivity, which won him his second Nobel, are used in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, NMR, or its medical subtool, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Have you ever had an MRI? That was made possible by the trans, by his understanding of of uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. There is a lot of this used in criminalistics today. Um, when we first discovered uh, DNA and how DNA, let's just say how DNA could identify individual people. Um, we, uh, uh, the police investigators might find a speck of blood or a speck of semen, but they didn't have enough to really identify it. But then, um, these other ways were developed where they could <clears throat> multiply a chain of DNA, multiply it to be a larger piece so they could then do more tests on it. It's really amazing. Uh, all right, we'll stop right here and continue uh, with more portability.